share. Okay. So welcome to um, our presentation for first time home buying. Um, this is a presentation that actually really isn't just for first time home buyers, but really any home buyers. Um, you know, I think that we recognize that the home buying process can be a little bit overwhelming and sometimes confusing for people. And so the purpose of this presentation and today's webinar is really just to try to explain some of the things that we think, um, you know, questions that come up and some of the things that, um, you know, people really want explanation on before they start their home buying process. So, um, you know, thank you to everybody who joined um, and we're really excited to, to be here today. So I am Sarah Piampiano. I'm a realtor with 8Z Real Estate. And joining me today is Britt Alexander, who is a senior loan officer with 8Z Mortgage. And Britt and I have done a number of transactions together. Um, she is amazing at what she does. So I feel really fortunate that she's here to present today and talk about the lending process and mortgages and um, all things related to, to lending. So Thank thanks, Britt. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll just kick right, you know, kick it off and get right into it. Um, the agenda today is really kind of two parts. The first is sort of the primary questions around the home buying press process and, you know, addressing those. And then the second portion is going to be Britt talking about um, what you need to know about mortgages and the lending process. Um, so hopefully that will cover, you know, a pretty good chunk of people's questions and, um, you know, answer, answer a lot of the questions that people have. So from my standpoint, you know, I really think that most buyers, including first time home buyers typically ask four primary questions. Uh, the first being, when's the right time to buy? And I think that's a question that a lot of people are asking right now. You know, last year at the beginning of the year, we saw interest rates that were really low, but a really quite a frenzied market. And then in the second half of the year, we saw interest rates go up pretty significantly and the market really cooled down. And so people were confused and not really sure, you know, is now a good time to, to buy or not? So we'll talk about that. Um, what's the process of buying? You know, what's the timeline? What do I need to do? Um, how long does it take? So that's the second question. Um, how do I choose a broker or a lender? You know, I think a really interesting stat that I'll go over again, you know, a little bit later on, but 80% of buyers typically choose the first broker or lender that they come in contact with. And actually there's a pretty big um, variance in real estate agents and lenders. And so actually taking the time to speak to uh, a few real estate agents, speak to some lenders and, you know, find somebody that you think is really going to work for you is important. And then lastly, what happens if I get an offer accepted? Can I pull out of the transaction? Can I cancel a transaction? Am I bound to that? Um, I think a lot of people feel a lot of anxiety about, um, you know, going under contract and what that all means. And so, you know, we'll talk about that and what your predictions are as a buyer. So first things first, um, when is the right time to buy? And I broke it into two um, two separate considerations, the first being personal and the second being market. Um, and to be totally honest with you, the really the primary driver of people's um, timing on buying is really around uh, personal dynamics. And so, you know, your lease is up, you're changing a job and having to move states, you're getting divorced, um, somebody's retiring, there's been a death in the family, um, there's some health complications that are forcing you to, you know, want to consider what type of home you own. And there's a whole host of reasons, but usually it's people's personal circumstances that really drive their buying decisions um, over market conditions. So, you know, when you are thinking for yourself, is this the right time to buy? You need to really be just assessing your own personal circumstances where things, things stand in your life and what that means in terms of uh, timing for you to be buying right now or not. Um, from a market standpoint, and I think this is obviously a really important thing to talk about, um, the idea of trying to time the market is a fallacy. You know, the market is constantly ebbing and flowing. It's very fluid. It's constantly changing. So, um, you know, trying to time the market, just it's, it's almost impossible to do. 
Um, we'll go into it a little bit in a little bit more detail in the next slides, but um, in general, the housing market is really dictated by three primary drivers, which is inventory or supply of homes, which is the number of homes in the market, the jobs market, and interest rates. So, you know, if the supply of homes is high, usually that causes prices to come down. If the jobs market is really strong, which it is right now and has been for the last several years, people have jobs, they have money, they're more inclined to buy homes. So that's going to increase demand and usually drives prices up. Um, and similarly with interest rates, when interest rates are up, demand falls, um, people are a little bit less inclined to buy. And when interest rates are low, people are more inclined to buy and that typically drives demand, which causes prices to increase. So, you know, those are the three primary components and drivers of what we're seeing um, in terms of the changes in the housing market. And that really comes into the law of supply and demand. So the idea that when demand falls, supply or the number of homes increases and prices are gonna fall. When demand increases, more homes are being bought, supply is gonna go down, prices are gonna increase. And I think over the last year to two years, it's a perfect example of supply and demand scenarios. You know, between 2020 when the pandemic started and mid 2022, uh, the interest rates were at like unprecedented historical lows and that caused a, you know, huge increase in demand. We saw multiple offer situations pretty much across the board. There was very low supply and prices shot up. Um, you know, I think in 2021, the prices of uh, housing prices in Colorado went up over 20%, which is, you know, pretty insane when you think about it. But, you know, that was pretty consistent across the board, you know, on a national level. So um, in the second half of 2022, interest rates went from, you know, hovering around three, three and a quarter percent to over 7%. And that caused a huge drop in demand. And with the drop in demand, we saw prices starting to come down and soften quite a bit. And then as we start into Q1 2023, there's a few factors coming into play here. So um, there's seasonality. So uh, usually at the start of the year, buyers come out of the woodwork, there's higher demand, um, prices tend to increase a little bit. When we hit the summer months, people are on vacation, demand kind of falls a little bit in the fall, it goes back up and then towards the end of the year, it comes back down. So we're in that, you know, start of the season, start of the year seasonality, uh, uptick in demand. Um, but in addition to that, we've seen interest rates come off a little bit. And so demand has increased and we're seeing more multiple offer situations. But I think certainly the last two years is like a pretty good, it's a pretty good snapshot on, on the supply demand, um, love supply and demand. <clears throat> so a lot of people want to know, <coughs> excuse me, is it better to buy when you have lower interest rates or is it better to buy when you have higher, higher interest rates? And my answer to that is there's going to be trade-offs no matter what. Um, you know, with lower interest rates, certainly your monthly payment is going to be lower. And in a lot of circumstances, you're going to be pre-approved pre for a higher purchase price. But there's also some downsides to lower interest rates, which is demand is going to be higher. And when demand is higher, there's going to be more multiple offer situations, competitive bidding scenarios. So that's going to cause prices to go up. You're probably going to have to pay over list price. You're probably going to have to give up some of the amazing protections that are included in a purchase contract. Um, you know, some of the ones that you may have heard of before are, you know, covering an appraisal gap or, you know, waiving the inspection. And what that means is if you waive the inspection, <clears throat> let's say that you go and you put an offer in a house and you win and you get an inspection and there's, um, there's a foundation issue. Well, if you've waived your inspection, that means that that cost is on you. You cannot negotiate for, uh, foundation repair with the seller. And so that is um, incremental cost that you're going to have to incur. And similarly with an appraisal gap, which is very, very high level, essentially lenders will only lend on what the appraised value of your home is. And so if you're, if you're getting a, getting a loan. Um, and so let's say that you're buying a $750,000 home and the home appraises at 700,000, that lender is only going to lend on the $700,000 appraisal. And so if you're going to buy at 750, you have to cover that $50,000 gap in cash. Um, so there's a lot more that buyers are kind of giving up to be able to buy at a lower interest rate. With a higher interest rate, 
you know, the obvious downfalls are you have potentially higher monthly payments and your pre-qualification um, from a purchase price perspective is going to be lower, but um, there's a lot of actual benefits as well. So you may be able to buy a home below list price. Um, you're in a controlling position as a buyer um, <clears throat> and you're able to maintain some of the really important rights that I just talked about that you'd be giving up at lower interest rates. So, you know, be able to maintain the inspection protections. So if you have that foundation issue, you can then go negotiate for the seller to pay for that versus you. Um, you don't have to give up and cover the appraisal gap. So if the appraisal comes in low, you can negotiate a lower purchase price or you know negotiate something with a seller so that it works out in your favor. Um, and there's fewer competitive offer situations. So you know there's there's give and take from both sides, but you know just because it's a higher interest rate does not necessarily mean that um, you know it's a bad buying environment. And in fact, I would argue, and I think many would argue, it's actually a better buying environment for um, for buyers. So I'm going to give a quick example um, of, you know, early 2022 when interest rates were low versus today's market. Um, my example is a $750,000 home. Um, in early 2022, you are facing multiple offer situations and likely going to be offering fifty dollars or $100,000 over asking. So rather than paying $750,000, you're paying $800,000 or $850,000. And that is legit. I mean, I um, put in an offer on a home that was listed at $700,000 in May of last year, and it ended up selling for $915,000, $215,000 over asking, which was crazy. Um, so, you know, $50,000, $100,000 over asking, uh, even, you know, with a 3.25% interest rate, that's an implied um, principal and interest payment, monthly principal and interest payment of between $2,700 and $3,000. That's assuming a 20% down payment. Of 160 to 170 thousand um, dollars. So some of the kind of specifics of a of a situation like this, it's likely going to be a competitive offer situation. In most cases, in early 2022, all cash offers were winning. And so if you as a buyer were offering less than 20 percent down, if you were a VA buyer or an FHA uh, buyer, that wasn't really putting you in a position to um, to be able to win in many situations. So that was, it was excluding a lot of potential buyers and really ruling out a lot of buyers from the market. Um, you'd have to cover the appraisal gap, which I mentioned before, and you'd likely need to waive inspection. And so you'd have to cover all the cost of your inspection repairs. So not only are you paying over asking price, you're having to put more down for down payment and you're potentially having other costs associated with inspection repairs and whatnot. In today's market, Right now in Denver Metro, the median house is selling for between 98 and 99% of list. So if you're paying between 98 and 100% of list, that same house is going to be selling for 735 to 750,000. Um, the higher interest rate, obviously, you're going to have a higher monthly payments, um, about $1,000 more per month. But from a down payment perspective, assuming you're putting 20% down, Instead of putting down 160 or 170 thousand dollars, you're putting down 147 to 150. So that's between 10 to 23 thousand dollars less upfront that you're having to pay. So you could take that money and either save it, put it elsewhere, put it into your house, whatever you need to do. Um, other aspects of you know offers in today's market: fewer competitive offer situations, which is great, although the market is picking back up as I mentioned. Um, people are willing to accept financed offers. So people with VA loans or FHA loans are able to get back in and buy homes now. They're accepting offers for less than 20% down. So in this example, I use 20% down for a down payment, but let's say that you only put 3% down. Well, if you put 3% down, instead you're looking at a $25,000 down payment. And rather than working out $150,000 up front, you're you know, saving yourself $125,000 in cash. So it's pretty meaningful. Um, and then you're also not waiving your inspection um, protections. So if you have that foundation issue, which can be fifteen, twenty, thirty, sixty thousand dollars, depending upon what it is, that's something that the seller is covering versus versus you. Um, and you also have the opportunity to potentially potentially uh, negotiate for the seller to buy your interest rate down. So you know there's there's give and take again on both sides, but um, just kind of like wanted to lay out a, a real life example. 
that's just sort of summarizing what, what I said earlier. Um, the, the biggest thing I would say here on this slide is, um, you know, I looked at sort of what the break-even point would be. So on the lower interest rate end, you're, yes, you're paying more. Um, and on the high interest rate end, you're paying more on a monthly basis. And it would take you about eight years of higher monthly principal and interest payments to break even with the amount that you would be investing um, by having to pay over a list price on the lower interest rate um, offer. So, and, and with that, you know, interest rates tend to run in three to five year cycles. So, you know, within that eight year period, hopefully interest rates are going to come back down. They may not go to, back to three and a quarter, but, you know, hopefully they're going to come back down and you can refinance them to a lower rate. Sarah, can I add something real quick? Sure. So that is why 8Z Mortgage has something called a refi reward specifically for this purpose. You know, a lot of people have heard the statement, you marry the house, you date the rate. And in this market, it's so true because if you're able to take advantage of the market in just exactly what you described versus what we were seeing in 2022, you're getting in purchasing the home at the right time, but you're also getting in kind of at the top of the rates, which means that we're hopefully about to see the rates come down. And as they do, you may not even have to wait that three to five year cycle because you're getting in right now before the rates start to decrease. We anticipate the Fed to start lowering the interest rates in 2024 after last um, last week's meeting. So what we do is we have a refi reward program, which waives the appraisal and the lender fees for anybody that purchases with 8Z mortgage um, in order to kind of help that so that when the time comes, we're saving you costs so that you can take advantage of not only the market to purchase your home, but also the interest rate market when it turns to your favor. Which is awesome. <clears throat> I mean, it really just puts you in a situation where you can take confidence and, you know, whatever rate you're getting in at now, you're going to be able to refi and, and feel protected and like not having to spend, shell out a lot of extra money to do that refinancing. So it's a great program that's being offered by AC. Um, this just, these three graphs just are another way to demonstrate sort of what we're seeing in the market right now. The graph on the left is, um, it's called um, days on market, which is the number of days that a house on average is sitting um, before it goes under contract. The middle graph is the percent of close price to list price. And then the um, right graph is the median close price in all of Den Denver Metro. So, you know, what we're seeing is at the peak of the market, Homes were going under contract. The median home was going under contract in four days. And right now we're at 35 days. So homes are sitting for longer. And because they're sitting for longer, sellers are willing to offer more concessions, take a lower offer price. And so now rather than being going for 105% over or 5% over list price, 105% of list price in April, 2022, homes are going for between 98 to 99% of list price under list. And obviously the consequence of that is prices are coming, the median price of home is coming down. So um, just wanted to um, show that graphically. Oops, I don't know why it's doing that, sorry. Okay. Um, interest rates, and Britt talked a little bit about this um, when she was just talking about the refinance program, but I think this is a great graphic uh, it just talks about, it, it shows essentially um, interest, the historical interest rates. You can see in the 1980s, interest rates were extremely high. There was huge inflation. That was when the Fed was raising rates to really try to um, bring things down. Um, rates were up in the high teens, which is like kind of unfathomable, um, partic particularly over the last 20 years or so where we've really enjoyed lower rates. And yes, interest rates are higher. <clears throat> I don't think we've <clears throat> had rates this high since 2008, 2007, something like that. But if you look on a historical basis, rates are still historically low. Um, the average historical rate is 8% and we continue to be below that. And so, um, you know, I think that it's important to keep that in perspective. Um, this is still not a bad rate and we do expect rates to come back down. In the right-hand graph, uh, these are three, uh, <clears throat> three predictions for 2023. Um, you know, they're still not in the threes. You know, everybody wants the threes. Again, I don't know if we'll ever get back there. That was, you know, unprecedented, unprecedented. but 
um, it does show rates coming back down. And so, and I think, you know, it's certainly something that we can expect going forward. And as Britt said, marry the home, date the rate. It's really the idea. If you find the right home, jump on the opportunity. And, you know, the rate can always be renegotiated. It can be refinanced. You can get the lower rate when that opportunity comes up. But if you find the right home, take a, take the opportunity to get that. And now is a great time to jump on it because of, you know, the buyer is really in control. Um, here, just talking a little bit about renting versus owning, because a lot of people who are first time home buyers are coming from a rental situation. And there's pros and cons to both for sure. Um, you know, on the renting side, you know, really the downfall from my perspective is that you're paying somebody else's mortgage. Like they, most people have a mortgage on that home that you're living in and you're just paying for it. So, you know, why not take the money that you're investing in renting and put it towards yourself and building equity? I feel like that's such a compelling reason to be a homeowner. Um, you know, certainly as a renter, there's the convenience of not having to deal with all of the homeowner issues. If there's an issue with the roof or there's a leak or, you know, you need to do something with the siding or the window breaks. I mean, that's on the landlord versus, you know, as a homeowner, if any of those things happen, it's on you. So it is important when you are thinking about purchasing a home and thinking about your finances, you need to incorporate that, you know, into your thinking. And you need to remember that you're going to have to probably front up some money to do repairs on the home. And, you know, it's just, it's important to factor that into your consideration. Um, but also with owning, you get the tax incentives that you don't get as a renter. So, um, you know, it's just, I wanted to like outline the pros and cons of that. In terms of timeline, it's really an eight step process. Um, the first three steps, choose a realtor, get pre-approval, pre-underwritten and search for homes are kind of interchangeable. You know, a lot of people start with searching for homes on Zillow. Uh, then they might get pre-approval and then choose a realtor. Other people choose a realtor, get pre-approval, search for homes. I mean, whatever way that that process starts for you is fine. Um, and, and they are kind of interchangeable. The timeline on this is fluid. So for the average home buyer, it's usually about an year, a one year timeline from the time they start thinking about buying a home to the time they actually close. But for other people, it can go faster. Like maybe you just decide that you're going to buy and, you know, that process could happen in a couple of months. Maybe you find out that you're having a job change and you immediately, you know, get to work with, with buying a home. So it is a little bit fluid. Um, but I will say that from the moment that you make an offer until closing on average, and Brett, you can um, weigh in on this as well. It's usually somewhere between, I would say 21 to 30 or 21 to 45 days on average. Um, so it's really sort of that the process of searching for homes, choosing a realtor, um, getting the pre-approval, that is sort of, that's the, the timeline that could be quite short or quite long. And then once you actually do make an offer, it, it moves pretty quickly. Um, so I'm not going to go all of the, uh, through all of these in detail. Uh, we will be sending these slides out. Um, and so you can, you know, read through all of the little notes underneath and it gives just some good tidbits and highlights on things that you need to consider during each of those phases. Um, how do I choose a broker or a lender? Um, this goes back to what I was saying at the beginning, 80% of buyers typically choose the first realtor, first lender that they come in contact with. And not all realtors and not all lenders are the same. And they don't provide the same quality of service. And so taking the time to interview a couple of realtors, interview some lenders, understand what their programs are, understand how they're going to work for you, will actually set you up to find the home that you want in a um, much less stressful way. If you are hiring somebody that is not not particularly um, committed to what your needs are and finding you the right um, you know, lending program or whatever, it's just going to be a lot more complicated and a lot more stressful. So, you know, invest the time up front to um, you know, ask questions um, and 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 interview a couple of people. And when you're looking for a realtor, um, you know, you really want to feel like they have your best interest in mind. Are they really working for you? Are they listening to you? Are they asking the right questions to find out what it is that you truly want and why you want those things? Um, an example of that is I have, um, when I meet with my buyers, I have them do kind of like a T-chart and I ask them to make a list of um, 
what they want in a house. And then I have them make a list of why they want those things. And what we discover through that process oftentimes is what they think they want isn't always what they need. Um, an example of this, a very easy example of this is somebody who comes in and says, well, I definitely need a four bedroom house. And then if you say, well, why do you need a four bedroom house? And they say, well, I definitely need three bedrooms because you know my wife and I need one. We need a bedroom for my, our child. And then we want a guest room, but I want a fourth bedroom because we want a at home office. Well, by only limiting yourself to four bedrooms, you're limiting the number of homes that you can look at versus if you look at three bedroom homes with potential office space in the basement as like a nook or whatever, you're opening up the opportunity to actually find a home that's really going to be going to work for them. So, you know, again, finding an agent who's going to really ask questions and break things down is really important. Finding an agent who um, is really willing to connect with the lender is also really important. The lender and the realtor work really closely together. Good lenders and good realtors work closely together, and they're going to work for you throughout the process to um, make sure that you are getting you know the best service possible. Um, and Britt, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about choosing a lender and your thoughts on that. Yeah, I would I would agree. I think it looks very similar, making sure that you connect with them, making sure that they're asking what your goals and your needs are. Similar to you, Sarah, when I have an initial consult with a client, I'm asking, what's your monthly payment goal? You know, what kind of cash are we looking at, whether it's $1,000 or $100,000? Um, and a lot of times in this market, it's actually less about interest rate and more about meeting those two goals. Because when you ask a home buyer, what's your monthly mortgage payment, they will be able to tell you. But if you ask them what their interest rate is, a lot of times they don't really know. It's the payment that drives. And so working in connection with you and with them to ask the right questions, find something that meets their needs and sticks within their budget. Um, is huge and educating them through the process as a first time home buyer, this is going to be the biggest purchase that they will have ever made. And so making sure that you're not only giving them the information, but educating them throughout that process. So again, making sure that the lender is reputable, making sure that they do have access to multiple first time home buyer programs making sure they have access to down payment assistance programs. And a lot of times, and we'll get into this, I think in a different slide, but the difference between a lender versus a broker, which is what 8Z Mortgage is, um, can sometimes make all the difference on your loan itself and what options are available to you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. I think this is my last slide. So um, big question for a lot of buyers, what happens if I get an offer accepted and I wanna pull out of the transaction? Like, is that going to be okay? And the short answer is yes, in most circumstances. Um, there are a slew of protections in the offer contract that protect the buyer. So that if certain circumstances pop up, it provides the buyer the opportunity to back out of the transaction. Um, I've listed here the key contract protections or contingencies. Um, so an example, I'll go back to the foundation issue. You go under contract, you're super excited, you go get an inspection and the inspector is like, you have some serious foundation issues. And you may just say, I just, I can't deal with foundation issues. I don't wanna go through the process of having the foundation fixed. This is too much for me. As long as it's by the inspection objection deadline or the inspection deadline, you can pull out of the transaction. Um, so, Another example is an appraisal. You know, if the appraisal, let's say you offer $800,000 a home, the house appraises at 650 and you're like, oh my gosh, this thing just appraised way below what I'm, what I'm willing to pay for it or was willing to pay for it, you can pull out of the transaction. So there's a number of protections for you. You go, you're, you buy a house that's gonna be part of an HOA, you wanna paint your house purple, you go through the HOA docs and it says that no houses can be painted purple or, you know, it can't be painted a certain color. That doesn't really fit with what your hopes and dreams are for that house. You can pull out of the transaction. So there are protections um, in certain circumstances. So there's something called earnest money, which means when you go under contract, you, you provide within the first few days kind of like a down payment on your down payment. You provide a certain amount of money that goes into escrow that goes towards the transaction. Um, that's kind of like a good faith uh, payment saying that you're serious about buying buying the house. And there are certain instances where 
um, when, if you decide to pull out a transaction, you will lose that earnest money. And that could be 5,000, 10,000, $25,000. It depends on the size of the transaction and how much the, the seller is asking for in earnest money. But, um, I, the, the point of the slide is more that there are protections for you. You can get out of the transaction. Um, and so, you know, you need to go into it knowing that you do have those protections. And with that, Britt. Yeah, thank you. So similar to the real estate side, there's a lot of things that for first <laughs> know about the mortgage side of things, getting pre-approved can seem a little overwhelming in the beginning, unless you have, you know, the right, um, know the right questions to ask or the right lender to connect with. So we'll walk you through the key things that you'll want to know are one, what is the pre-approval and what does the process look like? Um, what are the down payment requirements? Do you really have to have 20% down? Um, rate locks and the timing of that. Closing cost, which is a lot of people think shoppable when they think rates are shoppable, but closing costs actually are as well. And then kind of walking you through the, the loan timeline and what that process looks like. So the first one, a uh, lot of questions, right? Do you have to put 20% down? The short answer is no. Um, a big one is when you look at what rates are advertised um, throughout the media and certain websites, um, that may look completely different. A lot of times they're putting their best rate forward, meaning, okay, the fine print says that you have to have an 800 credit score and 40% down um, in order to get the rate that's advertised. And so a lot of times you may see an interest rate out there that costs $20,000, but as a first time home buyer, your rate may look very different. So it's important to match with a lender as early in the process as you can so that you know what your specific interest rate would look like. Um, asking questions about how much closing costs are, what programs are available, um, how fluidly you work with your realtor um, throughout the market, which is especially important in the Denver area because our market is so unique. It's a little different than what I think the, the national level looks like. So knowing the different tax areas, knowing um, about if how long a home has been sitting, if there's a possibility of getting seller concession, all of those things are incredibly important and will make a difference if your lender and agent are working seamlessly together. Um, so what's the pre-approval process look like? So most of the time when you are connected, and I'll use myself as an example, um, you know, if you're connected from Sarah to me, you'll fill out about a 15-minute online application. Um, with your permission, we pull credit. We ask questions. I Sometimes I'll deep dive into if, we're, if we have a chance to chat before the application happens, we'll work on those goals and I'll structure the pre-approval specifically to your needs. Um, but a lot of times we just have a conversation and walk through what it looks like and um, we collect your income, we collect your assets, we ask all of those questions. And if all matches within the realm of what you're aiming to get, we issue what's called a pre-approval letter, which says, hey, we've looked at your credit, we've looked at your goals, we've looked at your income and how long you've been at your job, all the preliminary items. And it matches with the guidelines for pre-approval. And at that point, I will most of the time through asking about goals, be able to match um, clients with a specific program or an initial program for that pre-approval letter. We can actually level that up to a different, uh, to not, um, so a different kind of pre-approval, which is called a, a pre-underwritten approval, which means that your loan goes from just an initial pre-approval to actually a, a full underwritten approval. And this can help you be set apart in the market because a lot of, a lot of lenders will just give you a pre-approval. But what we do at this point is we will ask for documents documentation. We will underwrite your file as though you were already under contract. We just do it as a property TBD, so a to be determined property, and we send it to underwriting. And the underwriter will look at all of the items and say, hey, you know what? We agree this client has stellar qualification and we're going to upgrade this pre-approval to an actual pre-underwrite and take the pre away and actually give you an approval letter. So when Sarah would make an offer for you, instead of issuing a pre-approval letter, we would actually have an approval letter. And that is where we start getting into quicker closes. And sometimes in 
multiple offer, offer scenarios, we can start to be even more competitive with an approval letter instead of pre-approval with a 18 to 21 day close instead of a 30 or 45 day close. So all with the intention of setting you apart from the competition. So um, same day pre-approval happens a lot. Um, it's all based on how quick you, we can connect. So if you do a pre-approval letter or a pre-approval application in the morning, my goal is always to get back to you as, as quick as possible. And 90% of the time that is same day, um, as long as our schedules align. So having you fill out the application, providing some documents, um, doing a quick follow-up chat to let you know what that amount is before I send the letter, and then sending out that pre-approval letter so that you can get shopping on, on a home. So the turn time for these is usually pretty quick. So a pre-approval is really important because as you are going out and looking at homes, there's benefits of when you make an offer, having a pre-approval letter for the seller, but there's also benefits for you. And I would say the, the biggest one for first-time home buyers is knowing where to shop because the last thing you want to do is shop that $750,000 example home and it be your dream home and then find out, oh, we're only approved for 625. We can't make an offer. That is what we try to avoid. We want to get you pre-approved for 625. So you're shopping within your realm up front and also the opposite. You know, we don't want you to miss out on a home that's at 775 because you think you only pre-approved for 700 or 650. So getting that number very specific um, and also knowing what your monthly payment's going to look like. Through that pre-approval process, we identify program, we identify rate, we help estimate payments. So it's very transparent once you're through that pre-approval process, what a monthly payment should look like on the home that you're looking at. So that way there's no payment shock, there's no out-of-pocket cost shock. Um, we're really walking with you through this process step-by-step step from the time you identify that you like the home to the time that you write the offer so that there's less surprises. So if you have the pre-approval in place, we're able to provide all of those services um, to help elevate that experience for you. I'd also just add to that that, you know, a lot of buyers don't always want to buy at what they're pre-approved for. So maybe somebody's approved for $800,000, but the monthly payment on the $800,000 house is not what they're comfortable with. And so, you know, going through that pre-approval process, and again, as Britt was saying, kind of understanding what all of those numbers look like at different price points is really helpful because then if you're, you know, wanting to do a monthly payment that's $500 less or $300 less or whatever, then it helps both you and your realtor and the lender understand kind of like where you need to be shopping. So even if you are pre-approved for more. Absolutely. That's, that's a great point, Sarah. Yeah. So <laughs> Why did I get quoted a different interest rate than my friend? That's I hear this a lot. Um, well, my friend got this rate, um, you know, and it could be that the friend bought in 2021 and their rate is 2.75, or it could be that the friend put 20% down and you're putting 3% down. So um, they're not compares. When you look at comparing interest rates, it, they're so specific to your individual need and your individual program. That's why that initial conversation and asking the right questions and pairing with the right lender to ask those questions is so important because the program that you choose, the credit score that you have, your debt to income, which is a big piece of your qualification, and it's really all of your debts, including your mortgage, your new mortgage payment, divided by your income. And so that these are going to be debts like car loans, credit cards, student loans, personal loans, things like that, not your phone bill or your current rent amount or you know electric bill, but things that are showing up on your credit, all added up divided by your income. And that can have an impact on your qualification and make it look very different from um, you know, your coworker. So that's why, again, that advis advisement to start early is important so that we can identify your specific situation and your specific rate. Um, credit score 
is a big factor, uh, probably the biggest fa factor when we're looking at interest rates and qualification. Um, you can do all the way down to a 620 credit score with FHA and potentially down even to 580. But the higher that you have, the higher credit score you have, the lower interest rate that you're going to have, the lower payment you're going to have, the higher qualification you're going to have. So there are multiple reasons to work on your credit. And even if you're a year out from purchasing, having an initial consult um, and even having your credit score checked to say, hey, there's some ways that you can boost this score from maybe a 680 to a 740 that could potentially save you four or $500 a month in monthly payment based on what your interest rate that you would qualify for. Um, and so your credit score, I love this little blurb that, that Sarah put in here, your credit score is 30% payment history, 30% amount of the debt that you have, 15% length of credit history, and then 10% new credit and types of credit. So um, that's one that I would save because that is really something to support you when you're looking and diving into what the, the details of your credit score are. And if you're wanting to improve it, it tells you what is weighted higher um, based on your credit score history. And that's, that could help improve your score along the way too. Yeah. And then I'm just going to add to that and, and Britt touched on this a little bit, but size of down payment, if you're putting down 20% or 30% or 40%, you're going to get a lower interest rate or it's going to impact your interest rate. You're definitely going to get a lower interest rate than if you're putting 3% down or three and a half percent down. Um, so, you know, certainly the size of your down payment is an advantage to putting less down because you have to, have, you have a less initial, you know, cash outlay, but the impact of that is going to be that you have a higher interest rate typically because you're considered to be a little bit higher risk because you don't have as much equity invested, right, Britt? Yep, exactly. And speaking of not needing to put 20% down, these are some of the programs that Sarah mentioned earlier. Um, a lot of people think you do need to put 20% down. The 20% down rule is actually to eliminate monthly mortgage insurance. So the 20% down does come into uh, effect, but mortgage insurance is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, it is there to allow you to put less than 20% down and also protect the investor. Um, credit score also helps to keep that number low and is very specific to you as well. Um, so for a conventional, you can do up down to 3% down for a first time home buyer program. For FHA, you don't have to be a first time home buyer, and, home buyer, and you can put as little as three, three and a half percent down. Um, and that's where you can have the lower credit score um, 580 is is traditional, sometimes down to 500. Um, so that would be a program to help if you were working on credit and had you know the three and a half to put down. VA is a fantastic option. So if you qualify for a VA loan, um, you can actually put zero percent down and not have mortgage insurance. So VA is one of the best um, programs out there if you are a veteran and have the ability to, to do that, I would highly suggest it. Um, and then I think we have, uh, do you have Chaffa on one of the slides or the down payment I don't. Assistance? I did not put Chaffa on, but maybe you wanna talk a little bit about that. That's okay, yeah. So Chaffa is Colorado Housing Finance Authority, so it's an acronym, and it's great. It's Colorado's biggest down payment assistance program, which can allow some clients in between $1,000 down and seven to $10,000 down, just depending. And so those, programs are great for especially clients who go, you know what, I don't, I don't actually have the 3%, but I have somewhere in between. So 3% down on a $600,000 house would be 18,000. Um, and then you're looking at closing cost, um, escrow setup, kind of the other additional costs there, maybe 1% of the purchase price, let's say, so $6,000. So you would need $24,000 in that case. Chaffa, however, same $600,000 house, you'd need about eight to 10. So it can be a significant savings if you're in the higher purchase price. And that's something that we look at. Their qualifications are a little different, um, but that's something that I would also put into consideration in that original conversation of matching somebody with a program is if the need would be there to use Chaffa's down payment assistance program. So, um, so rate locks, when you're shopping for a mortgage, you, you shop in multiple aspects. One, you shop for the lender. You want to make sure that that 
lender is going to be available to you, that they're going to be transparent, that they're going to have your best interest in mind. Then once you you feel that you have somebody that you can really trust um, and you secure in, then you're going to start looking at interest rates. And the difference between having just one lender versus a broker, and I'll use Rocket Mortgage as my example, if you were to go and call up 1-800-ROCKET-MORTGAGE, you're going to get their retail channel um, and you're going to also get just Rocket's rates. So whatever Rocket is offering, in their programs that they're offering in their little wheelhouse, that's what you have access to. So it's kind of like walking into a coffee coffee shop and ordering a black coffee because that's all they have on the menu. However, with a broker like, like 8Z Mortgage, we have access to multiple lenders. So we can shop through Rocket, we can shop through Fairway, we can shop um, through Cherry Creek Mortgage, which is local here in Denver. So we have multiple programs, multiple investors and lenders that we can reach out to for your specific debt to income, credit score, et cetera, your situation, put it out there and, and shop for you to see who has the better interest rate, who has the better mortgage insurance, um, who's the better program. So you're not just specifically tied to one particular lender and their programs and offerings. You have access to multiple with 8Z Mortgage as a broker. And I'll just add to that. I did a deal recently where um, they use 8Z Mortgage um, to help get their get their lending um, in order. And Brett went and shopped it around. And at the time, it was actually almost where like the peak of the interest rates were and um, ended up going with a lender who had a program. It's called a float down. So if interest rates changed within a certain period of time of closing, that buyer was actually able to get the lower interest rate. And not all lenders provide that. And so interest rates changed, they came down and actually we were able to get my buyer a lower interest rate within just a few days of closing because they, you know, we were able to get a program with them that had this float down opportunity. So, you know, the great thing about using a broker, as Britt said, is you know, you're, you open up so many opportunities to really find the right lending strategy and program for you as a buyer. Um, and you, and, and you're not limited by just working with one person, which is, which is really great. Yeah. <clears throat> so closing costs, um, closing costs are also a shoppable item in addition to rate and mortgage insurance. Um, so these are the fees that are paid to the lender and other services such as appraisal and title are the biggest ones. So the true closing costs with a, tr with a traditional 8Z mortgage loan um, are about $2,300 to $2,800. Um, we don't add fees up on top of fees. So we working in connection with 8Z real estate really do try to keep our services as cost effective as possible. And those are not tied our fees, the, the title fees, the appraisal fee, the lender fees, none of those are tied to your loan amount. Um, so they're very upfront and we quote those at the at the beginning so that you know exactly what you're looking at as far as a total investment cost into your mortgage. Um, the other side of closing costs are actually something called an escrow setup. And that's that just means that you're paying for your first year of homeowner's insurance up front, which is traditional when you're purchasing a home. Um, three months reserves of your taxes, prepaid interest on the days that you own the home until your first monthly mortgage payment is due. Those items are not specific to the lender. Those are going to be specific to the home and the insurance that you choose. And so those are combined with the actual title appraisal lender closing cost. Um, and for a traditional home, one to 2% of your purchase price, I would say closer to one to one and a half for 8Z mortgage is about, um, a pretty good estimate. So if you're looking at a six hundred thousand dollar house, six to eight, six to nine thousand um, would be traditional for what you would want to add on top of that down payment. Um, and those can, you know, those can be detailed out and worked through and shopped as well um, when the time comes, and we can walk through those. So the upfront costs that are in addition to your down payment, um, there's really three things that you pay up front. And that's going to be the first thing that you pay is earnest money, which Sarah already shared. Um, so you'll pay your earnest money, then you'll pay for your inspection. And Sarah, how much is an inspection usually like four, 450 to 550? Um, 
uh, inspection itself is usually between like 280 to $350. And then there's some additional services that typically you want to get done in Colorado, which is uh, radon testing and a sewer scope. So all in, if you do all those three things, it typically is going to run you about 650 bucks. Great. And that is not something that's actually included in the closing cost quote, because as a mortgage um, company, we don't require you to get an inspection, although it's highly suggested, it's not required to get the mortgage. So we don't quote that in with our fees. Um, the only other item that you pay up front with the mortgage is your appraisal. And that is credited to you. Um, you know, I like to quote hey, your closing costs are going to be six grand. Let's say your appraisal is a thousand just for round number sakes. You would pay a thousand dollars up front and then you'd pay the remaining five at closing. So um, everything that we quote up front is we try to do all in so that you have a very clear picture of what's due. And then anything you pay up front is credited back to you at closing. And, and along these lines, you know, if you're going to go out and get quotes from multiple lenders, you want to look, you don't want to just look at the interest rate. You want to look very closely at what they're, closing cost figures are because sometimes they might quote you a lower rate, but then you look at your closing costs and they're actually quite high. So, yeah. um, you know, that's a real big factor when you are working with a lender, you know, making sure that you're getting not just an interest rate, but, and, you know, your monthly payment, but also, you know, that your closing costs are in line with what um, you can afford and what you're expecting and, and is okay and something you're comfortable with. Absolutely. So the loan time frame, um, I won't go through all of these. Um, you can reference back to them, but basically through the pre-approval process, especially if you do the pre-underwrite process, you do a lot of the work up front. And we like that because once you go under contract, you're going to want to do, you know, you're going to be working on the inspection. You're going to have documents to sign. So our goal with the pre-underwrite phase is before you find a house, let's get a lot of the documentation in. Then once you go under contract, it's pretty straightforward. You get a contract accepted. Um, we work on locking your rate with you. We ask for remaining documents. You get your approval um, and, and you're all the while doing your homeowner's inspection and then we're on our way to closing. So in order to streamline the process, the sooner you start the pre-approval and to note, our pre-approvals are good for 120 days. So if, if you're wanting or thinking that you're going to shop in the next 60 to 90 days, it's never too early to start the pre-approval process. It just kind of gives you a clear picture earlier in the process so that you can really be educated when you step into a home that you like. And I'll, I will add another note here. You know, it can make a difference between getting a deal done and not getting a deal done. Um, if you have gone through the pre-approval process, you've given all the docs that Britt has requested up front, they have, you know, put in the legwork up front, then sometimes, you know, sometimes homeowners, they're, they need to move quickly. They need to, they, like their number one goal is just to get, you know, their home sold and closed as soon as possible. And if you've done all that legwork up front, and you could put an offer and say, we can close in 18 days. And maybe the other person who's putting in an offer, it's a competitive offer situation, hasn't done that legwork and they can only close in 30 days. Well, you know what? You may win that offer because you did the pre-approval up front and you can do the 18 day close. And that's going to be really significant to that seller. So, you know, a lot of people, I think just kind of don't want to go through that pre-approval process and do that. And they, they don't actually realize that in certain circumstances, it truly does make the difference between getting the house and not. Absolutely. That's a great point. So some do's and don'ts of, of the mortgage uh, process. So when you're starting to think about purchasing a home, you wanna make sure that all your payments are made on time, that you're getting that pre-approval we just mentioned about, that you're saving as much as you possibly can. One of my suggestions usually is, a lot of people say, oh, do I need to pay off things? Do you know, or do I need to keep the money? I suggest us doing the application and pre-approval together to determine that because sometimes if if you have debts that don't actually need to be paid off or won't improve your credit score, sometimes it's going to benefit you more to maybe have 5% down instead of three and your rates better than to pay off debts. So I just advise don't 
don't take it into your own hands. Definitely have somebody in an, in an advisor role or as early in the process as possible to help you determine items like that. Um, and then I suggest making sure that you know what your budget is for a mortgage payment. Um, a range is fine. Hey, here's ideally where we'd like to be. Here's where our maximum would be. And then that also allows when you do the pre-approval to have a range of pre-approval. So if you were to say to me, I really want my payment to be between 2000 and 2500 um, that may look like between a 375 and 425 purchase price. It may be dependent on if you're looking at a single family home or a townhome with an HOA. So those are things that we really want to get specific with as early in the process as possible so that you have a clear guidance. Um, and those are things that we can help with. Some things to not do, um, you know, don't make any significant career changes. You know, don't quit your job. Don't become self-employed. Anything like anything that are happening like that, um, connect with a lender and ask up front, hey, I'm wanting to buy a home in the next six months, but I just started consulting and I think I'm going to start doing that full time. Is that going to impact me? Because it, it will. And so anything that you have majorly going on with your finances or your job or your credit or even purchasing a new car, um, those are all things that can impact your, your ability to qualify. So if you know that buying a home is in your near future, and when I say near, I would say within six to 12 months, if you're thinking also about doing other big, big purchases, or if you're thinking about um, cashing out investments or selling something to use for your down payment, those are all conversations we want to have so we can help advise you on how to handle those so it doesn't impact your mortgage qualification. Um, and then the other thing I would just mention is not to close off, not to close your credit cards or pay off old collections. A lot of times paying off old collections can actually negatively impact your, your credit depending on when they were put on and how long it's been since you've paid them. And we have something called a credit score simulator. So I can put that in and say, oh, if they pay this off, what is this going to do to your credit score? And we can determine together if it's going to increase it or if it's going to impact it negatively. So um, just getting with that advisor person through the mortgage side of things is so important as early as the process as possible. Perfect. Well, that is all we have. I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, we can kind of wait for a minute and see if anybody has anything. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I think my situation is pretty unique. Uh, I am new to this country again. So meaning that I studied here in, in California in between 2016 and 2018 for an MBA. But then I went back to my country and now I'm back here since um, May last year. Now uh, I have a, my credit score as of now, I've been, been taking care of it. So it's about 760. But then my uh, credit history, I think, depending on how you look at it, uh, it might be very short. Uh, it, I know that for some lenders, this is, uh, this is a, no, a straight no-go because you need to have at least three years of credit history nonstop. Uh, I would like to know about you uh, and, and the lender uh, you work with, uh, how would that go? Yeah, so we run credit through something called an automated underwriting system. And depending on multiple factors of your pre-approval, such as how long have you been on your job, what is your debt to income, you know, how much you make, all of those will factor in. And if your application overall is very strong, they don't necessarily require a specific minimum trade line amount. What we want to do is have credit history, which it sounds like you do, of longer th than six months. That's usually the, the caveat. A lot of times, if you don't have credit history um, longer than six months, you won't generate a credit score. So it sounds like if you have a credit score, you have enough history to at least look at the other determining factors and run it through our automated underwriting system. And it's pretty simple. It either gives us a green light and says, yes, the credit will work, or it gives us a red light and says, no, here's what we need to do to adjust it. But it is very specific to you as the client. Um, um, versus just cut and dry of, oh, if you don't have three, you know, trade lines, you won't get approved. That's not necessarily the case. There's definitely ways that we can look at getting you a pre-approval um, with less than three trade lines. All right. And then uh, on the employment history, I, I've been, I'm working for the same company since 2018. 
but then I was transferred to this country, uh, to the U.S. in uh, in May. Uh, would that count? Uh, how that count? Was it? Would it count only uh, since I joined the U.S. Uh, branch, or would it count since the beginning of my employment at the same company? Yeah, absolutely. It would count to the beginning of the employment. We have, I've worked with several clients who have out of, um, out of country income. And most of the time, each country is different as to what kind of documentation they will provide a summary similar to a United States tax return to say, yes, um, you know, Alex was employed in 2020, 2021. We usually want two years of history. Um, and then we can connect, you know, connect the, the work histories together. And then we would go off of your income that you, you're making making here in your role in the U.S. Understood. All right, thanks. Yeah, yeah you're welcome. I don't know if anybody else has any other questions, but um, we really appreciate everybody joining. Um, again, you know, we will send out the slides so you'll have access to those. And it has um, both my contact information and Britt's contact information. So um, if you have any follow-up questions or, you know, just want to get in contact with us and get more information, we are, you know, we'd love to hear from you and we're happy to provide that. That was great. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.